Now you hear it. When you're a child, you learn there are three dimensions. Height, width, and depth. Like a shoebox. Then later you hear there's a fourth dimension. Time. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Oh, hey, Michael. Hey, hey, Taylor. What are we drinking today? Oh, we got a Stevens IPA from Hellbent Brewing Company, and we're in person. I don't think this has happened since August. We were in person last week, but um, it was a little bit earlier in the day, so we, we didn't get to get our drink on. So this is a nice little throwback. I feel like everything's kind of back to normal, and we can get back in the swing of things. That's right. I was drinking coffee last time. Nice to uh, have some beer again. Mm -hmm. Especially this beer. It's been a while. Tasty. It, it's got that, that extra little citrusy hop to it. Tasty stuff. Today's a rescreening day. It sure is. What are we talking about? We've got Terry Malick as he goes by to his friends, which we are, and his film The Thin Red Line. Uh, it's based on a novel, and it's a film that I believe came out in 1998 in film festivals, but later qualified for awards, I think, in the 1999 season. So I, I'm not too sure exactly what year it's historically viewed through. I understand you are a fan of good old Terry's work. I am, largely. I think the the films that I'm most down on are... Jeez, his first or second film, I can't remember which one the one is that they drive the truck in the field in, or the car in the field. Um, Badlands? Badlands. I'm mm. not I'm not really a big fan of that one, and I don't like To the Wonder. Mm. But otherwise, I'm a pretty big fan, and, you, you know, it's, it's Terry Malick. He made the new world. We owe him a great debt of gratitude. I like it. I like it. Uh, how about you? What first impressions on this one? Oh, I think this is a masterpiece. Flat out masterpiece. What about you? Yeah, I feel like it's a masterpiece, and because I'm unfamiliar with it, I don't feel graduated to the point where, like, I can express all the reasons why yet, but we'll stumble through conversation and try to assert some stuff before we do our, our revisiting of the film, I'm sure, in the next couple of years. Stumble, we will. We'll try to get to know the film a little bit better. Yeah, this is one of the few where I think maybe... It would behoove us to have another discussion about it in the future at some point. Mm. There's not too many movies where I feel like that is potential. But after the conversation, we'll see if there's still more to talk about on another visit of the film. First, we have Sidney Lamette's film, Dog Day Afternoon, which is going to be our next rescreening title to do a first impression on. You ready? Let's do it. For the people of the neighborhood, it was a sideshow. Sonny! But for Sonny and Sal, the hostages, and the cops, it was a dog day afternoon. It's all a whim. Rob a bank. I had a plan. I had it planned. WNEW -E plays all the hits. Will you keep away from this bank or we're going to start throwing bodies out the front door one at a time? I'm a Catholic and I don't want to hurt anybody, understand? How about letting the people out of the bank? I dare keep me alive. I'm going to let him out. Sir, can you tell me what the situation is? All right, who, who has to go to the bathroom? No! Honey, come on out! Yeah! It's just a freak show to them anyway. The most you're going to get is five years. You get out in one year, huh? Kiss me. I mean, I don't know about that guy out there. Hello, Sonny. You're on the air. Sonny Jesus, I was watching it on TV. Go back there, man! Why didn't he previous tell record. me he needed oh, money? He wants to kill me so bad he can taste it. Why rob a bank when you got a sucker for a mother? Oh, you're starting to get on my nerves. Yeah! Put it in your holster! We're entertainment, right? What do you, what do you, what do you got for us? All right, we just watched the trailer for Sydney Lumet's Dog Day Afternoon, which we'll talk about on our next episode of Rescreening. What do you think? I'm a huge fan of Sydney. I think that he is one of the most um, no bullshit directors, um, no frills, call it like you see it type of guys. And I'm, I'm, entirely unfamiliar with dog day afternoon other than anecdotally um hearing other people talk about it so i'm very excited to see this masterwork with a cast that 
well, at least a leading cast member in Al Pacino, who's also quite a bit no nonsense and uh, a lot of guff. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We watched the original theatrical trailer issued by Warner brothers here on YouTube, which undercuts what I believe is uh, kind of the under lane theme of two gay partners, as far as I'm aware in this film, which that trailer had absolutely none of. So I'm also interested to see how that is pulled off. I, I've heard nothing but praise for this film and I'm excited to watch it. How about you? Yeah, I'm coming at this from a very different angle because I'm really not that familiar with Sidney Lumet's work. Um, well, I should say firsthand, at least. I think the only film of his that I've seen is Before the Devil Knows You're Dead, but the big ones like 12 Angry Men or Network, I haven't seen. So I always have lofty ambition or lofty viewing goals going into these, but hopefully I'll try to get some of those other ones in ahead of time. Um but yeah, I, I, I'm excited. Um, it's a cool one because of its kind of like significance in film history as sort of a film emblematic of, you know, the new Hollywood, kind of the new gritty realism of, of 1970s American cinema and, you know, the emergence of antiheroes and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm certainly interested in, in it for that reason. Um, yeah, should be fun. Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. We recently joined as members, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. All right, let's get back to the thin red line. In this world, a man himself is nothing. And there ain't no world but this one. I seen another world. Sometimes I think it was just my imagination. If I go first, I'll wait for you there. On the other side of the dark waters. Why should I be afraid to die? I belong to you. straight up that hill there. How many men do you think it's worth? How many lives? There's nowhere we can hide except in each other. All right, Michael. The Thin Red Line was a novel written by James Jones. I believe at some point in the 50s. I don't know if you're familiar with James at all. I am not until we watched this film and then I did some research. But he wrote another book called From Here to Eternity, which was turned mm. into a 1953 picture that I believe won like seven awards. Best Supporting Actor for um, Frank Sinatra, Best Supporting Actress, Best Film, Best Director, Best Sound Editing, Best Mixing, um, whole suite of awards. And then we have this other novel from him, another World War II film, or another World War II book adapted to film, that went entirely unawarded mm. through the Oscars. Um, I'm not familiar with From Here to Eternity, but we are both familiar with The Thin Red Line. What do you think about its complete shirk from the Academy? Well, I think... I think this happens sometimes where the Oscars overlook a movie that in the long run uh, is it's better received than the initial reception would have had you think it would be received. Um, like, I think you frequently see this on lists of the best movies of the 1990s. I think I saw this on the Village Voices list of uh, the best movies of the 90s. I think you pretty frequently see it now labeled as a masterpiece. I think has time... I think time has served it well, despite it having been overlooked at the Oscars. And I think, if I remember correctly, it was nominated for Best Picture along with Saving Private Ryan. Which right? came out the same year, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, but Shakespeare in Love was the winner, I believe. And which, you know, had a big Weinstein push behind it. Sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder how much of the vote might have been kind of split between these two big World War II movies. That, and it let this uh, third title. Did you do any run research on 1990s war movies? No, I did not. I did. I typed that into Google, 
and the two leading films are Saving Private Ryan in this one. All the other ones are just small or or like, you know, cult classics like Three Kings, which came out in 99. Hmm. Um, David O. Russell picture, you know, like really nothing this grandiose or at this scale as far as war films. Um, and I really like Saving Private Ryan. I haven't seen it in a long time, but anecdotally, it, it definitely has like a favorites place for mm. me i i think i'd be interested in, in seeing it here in the next month while i'm still fresh off this viewing mm. of the thin red line just to kind of compare the two um not just malik and um spielberg but the casts as well like there's just mm. there's something very iconic about both of them i think mm -hmm. and the stars that are in each of these films that, that have gone on to do amazing things but when i think about the thin red line i don't it, it's kind of like the new world. I don't really feel like you can talk about it with the rest of cinema. It's kind of on an island. But if mm. I had to maybe pinion it to something else, I, I would say that it's a, it's closer to Apocalypse Now than anything else for me. It's closer to like mm. the pinnacle of a war cinema rather mm. than, you know, something insincere and, and unflattering. Yeah, I definitely think it's closer to something like Apocalypse Now than Saving Private Ryan, which just to use really simple labels, I would consider Saving Private Ryan Ryan a blockbuster, whereas uh, The Thin Red Line is a big budget art picture. Yeah. It's really not surprising that that wouldn't have been, you know, as praised as immediately as Saving Private Ryan. There's just such a uh, an immediate appeal to the action packed nature of that movie versus the philosophy of Malick. Um, yes. I think they're, yeah. Um, appealing to very different audiences. The, the war cinema here, the, the grit is almost entirely haunting. Um, there's moments like Woody Harrelson blowing his ass off that are like nearly comedic, but they're mm. not comedic. Um, and there's, there's the silent nature of nature in Malick's mm. films, which mm -hmm. is when he's at his best, he's either making the content equal to the form for me, something like song to song or night of cups in which you can't really distinguish what reality is and, and where sound ends um, as far as like using a soundscape to affect you emotionally versus actual sound from within the context of what the character's going through. Um, that's kind of what made waves very divisive is, mm -hmm. you know, he came up learning how to shoot um, on a Terry Malick project and has kind of taken a, a lot of Malick's choices with sound and editing. And I, I think that that's why a lot of people didn't respond to that. And here we have more of the new world where there's this men and nature and then men intertwined with nature occasionally um there's nothing like watching them crawl on their bellies through the grass with guns and then encounter a venomous snake mm -hmm. yeah and in contrast to something like saving private ryan which i think is relatively sentimental and more about really human things like courage and sacrifice and and that kind of thing um saving private ryan it, is more about courage. I, I don't know that I think the opposite here with the thin red line. I think that that ending with Jim Caviezel pu pulling all these um, soldiers who were a, a, essentially attempting a pincer movement um, disguised in, in this foliage camouflage down into this gully where he, he could ostensibly surrender. We don't really know if he could surrender. We've never seen someone surrender. The one time we see someone who's encountered the Japanese is in the tall grass after they take the hill and they see a, a man just brutally murdered. Mm. Very reminiscent of the steel helmet for me, just seeing, you know, brutal images. And so you don't know if he could have surrendered, but instead of surrendering, he pulls his gun and you can, the film communicates that he never had any intention of being able to do anything with that action. It was just one last defiant action of hope and heroism. And I think that there's a similarity there to the heroicism in Saving Private Ryan. However, Saving Private Ryan's less emotional. Um, 
Mm. Or, or less emotionally sincere, maybe. Maybe it's more superficially emotional, more about playing with the audience's emotions. And this is more Terry focused on the real idea of these characters going through that. Mm. That I think that's actually maybe slightly different from how I was going to characterize it, which is that Saving Private Ryan is more sentimental, whereas Malick's film is more spiritual. And I'm more inclined to call Saving Private Ryan a World War II movie versus Malick's, where I would more generally call it a war movie, because the fact that it's taking place in World War II, I think is really just serving as the context for the themes he wants to explore, which is more about war in general um, and man's sort of the contrast between the ugliness of war playing, ima- playing out amidst, you know, the, the beauty of the world. Um, whereas uh, other war films are, are similarly grounded in history, but more interested in um, kind of, you know, yeah, like you said, the, the manipulation of your emotion, which I actually think is quite like what, Trey Edward Schultz does in ways. I actually think he's doing a lot of manipulating of your emotions to get yourself really, really involved and really bringing the emotional hammer down. I think that's what some people don't like about it. I would say that is not quite as spiritual of a film. I I would agree. It's not as spiritual. Yeah. Like there, there's some tangential arguments that we could make, but we're not talking about waves. Um, so what I will say is first that I agree, right? I, I compared it to Apocalypse Now. I think that Apocalypse Now is not a Vietnam War film. Mm. More than it, it's a film about men at war. Mm. With themselves, with their duty, with their responsibility, with the ideas that they believe, that they think, their alcoholism, all sorts of things. It, it's more about men at war and Vietnam is the context. And this is more about the Pacific portion of World War II as the context for this war um, that is being experienced by these men. And Jim Caviezel is kind of our, our stand-in character that we follow along the most. Um, so I think you're you're right, but I can't... I, I don't know the best way to say that I think that you're right. It's spiritual first. That's always Malick's leaning is to go spiritual first. But I think in going spiritual, there's an emotional part that follows. Mm -hmm. And I definitely felt when these men are being cut down in the grass. I, I felt when I saw a lingering shot of a lizard hanging upside down from a tree, or I saw a, quizzical looking owl that had the fiercest eyes there, there's moments of spirituality that i think are tied to emotion and i think that that's why i love malik so much is because i don't only feel something spiritually that he's communicating i feel something that is a human emotion about spirituality yeah that makes sense for me what i think distinguishes it from both something like apocalypse now or saving private ryan is Sort of the open-endedness of it, I guess. The fact that it doesn't feel like this is about... This This isn't a film making a claim about war or commenting on war so much as it is just kind of, kind of an expression of wonder and curiosity about the nature of these things. About how such ugliness can, you know, exist in tandem with, with beauty, the beauty of, of man and nature. Um, it feels like a movie that has way more questions than answers, whereas I think... Um, you know, those films have clearer things that they're maybe trying to say, whereas Malik is, is que- has questions that he's trying to ask and explore through the medium. And for me, that that's maybe why this one feels particularly timeless, um, is because there is not as much definitiveness about it. I think that's also probably why it wasn't quite as well received, is that there's a certain satisfaction that comes with coming away from a movie and feeling like you kind of have it figured out. Um, I think you come away from this movie more with a sense of wonder than you do with answers about, um, you know, man or war or nature or anything like that. Yeah. I I think you're, everything you've said, I think I feel as as well. That word tandem, right? It's, 
it, it's very hard to talk about Malik and not use words such as juxtaposition, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, it's the juxtaposition of spirituality and all those other things. And I think you're right when you say it wasn't received because it wasn't definitive enough, right? For things to really inspire a lot of people to love them, I think they do have to be hyper specific. And mm-hmm. Malik is just not interested in playing that part of the game. He's more interested in things that are evergreen. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's ever created what I would call topical art. Mm -hmm. I think that what he creates is contemporarily wonderful, but also on top of that has a level of sincerity that as long as we're actual humans you'll always be able to map onto his project and they're so anti-commercial they're they're focused on how does it feel to be a wall on an island and have a large steel cruiser come into this beautiful pristine island hunting you and what happens when you return to that island and Everyone doesn't want to touch you, and they have a disease that you apparently gave them, which is a you know a little bit of a foreshadow to you know ideas that I think he explores in the new world. I, th- this is stuff that that's on his mind. Um, yeah, the, it's a film that's so hard to talk about. You're just talking around it more than talking about it. <laughs> yeah, well, you're talking about Jim Caviezel's character wit when you're Mm -hmm. talking about like a soldier having gone AWOL that's the first scene of the movie is him living among the Melanesians before we see combat or anything and I think he's just such an unconventional protagonist because you know Tom Hanks and Saving Private Ryan we get to know him we know what the goal is we watch him try to achieve that goal it's just classical storytelling I still don't think I have Jim Caviezel's character totally figured out i don't know that i can totally articulate what it is that he kind of finds in this time that he uh spends with the melanesians having gone awol um and you know what exactly it is that he is processing as he's um appearing so introspective throughout so much of the rest of the movie he's not a character with a goal um that we're watching him trying to achieve it's just him thinking um and yeah i think that itself is not the doesn't offer the same kind of satisfaction that a lot of people might be looking for yeah i if i was walking into a war movie and i wanted to be spoon-fed commercialized war film this is not that there's there's just so much to it i i think that now before we get any further would be a good time to read off that cast list as you mentioned which could be an episode by itself so i'll just try to be brief here this ensemble includes actors such as sean penn adrian brody jim caviezel ben chaplin george clooney john cusack woody harrelson elias kataeus jared leto tim blake nelson nick nolte John C. Riley, John Travolta. I think we can stop there. There's a lot more names. I don't think too many people would know them. Um, the, the one fun anecdote I wanted to give you, which mm. I don't think you're prepared for at all. So the, the war cinematography, the explosions, the palm trees, the, the, the sumptuous framing of this terrible action. Did it feel familiar at all? Did it feel familiar? Um, no, I don't think so. Because you've seen John Toll's wartime cinematography and one other truly great war film cinematic masterpiece. He was the cinematographer, sir, for Tropic Thunder. <laughs> ah. Another masterpiece. Of another course. war film masterpiece. Of course, of course. What a. I, I couldn't believe that the cinematographer for the thin red line went on to do Tropic Thunder. What a He does only the best. <laughs> only the best. Um 
So having read that cast list, do you have thoughts about Malik's interest in stars, his use of stars? Does it work for you? Does it not work for you? Um, that That's a loaded question because there's no way for me to see this at that point in time. Mm. Um, and I, I genuinely don't know what to do with taking you know, one of the most famous people in the nineties coming off of cheers and Woody Harrelson and blowing his ass off with a grenade. Um, I, I don't think that any of that was like cultural commentary. I think that was just sincere storytelling. And if you're not doing cultural commentary, then really you're just trying to get people that feel real. And I think that maybe the most interesting thing he did was buttressing John Travolta with George Clooney and having Mm. Nick Nolte be the thing that carried over that, that order of command, um, telling everyone else what to do. And, and I think that that's where it gets interesting is using that real star power, that real stern star power, um, from younger actors and George Clooney and John Travolta and have Nick Nolte, take over and tell everyone else what to do. I think that that was a really deft choice. I don't know if that's Terry more than his casting director or or what that is, but I think that that is one of the choices that was made in the film that really cements it as just in that echelon that is kind of untouchable, that goes above ratings. Yeah, yeah. The more I've watched his movies, the more I've come to think that he might just not care that much whether he has stars or not. I've maybe come to think that he just cares about getting the movies made. And if that's what it takes to get the financing for the art movie that he wants to make, it's, it's a means to an end. Um, I feel like he's really emphasizing kind of the common humanity across the stars in this movie, rather than leaning into the star power of any one person. So, um, yeah, to me, there's almost something kind of, uh, funny about George Clooney, you know, maybe one of the biggest or bigger stars of the movie, not coming until the very end, and he has a well, this 60 was seconds or something, right? So he'd been Batman and the guy from ER. I don't know that he'd been much else. Well, I think that was pretty big at the time, right? Yeah, I mean it, it was, but I I don't think that he was cemented as much as John Travolta was mm. through Pulp Fiction and um. God, whatever that other military movie was, I think it came out in 97. Um, just some of the pop stuff, Grease and well, there, there's uh, all that Saturday in the background. Night Beaver. Yeah. 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 But but coming up through the 90s, he, he had had quite a few hits other mm-hmm. than Battlefield Earth. <laughs> mm. Yeah. 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 I, I think this movie would have probably worked just as well for me had there been a quarter of the stars that it has. I think... Uh, that is really kind of a, a supplemental aspect of the of the film for me, and that's really not as much a part of its essence, I guess. Yeah, I, well, I will say that there's interesting things for me as a viewer here in 2020, late 2020, um, where it's like, Tim Blake Nelson has always never been close to bad. Very like, he's just next level. When you're watching him chew tobacco and spit, whether it's in the Battle of Buster Scruggs or it's in the Thin Red Line, there's something entirely convincing, committed, and perfectly fitting to the the tone of the film. It's incredible that someone can be in that Coen Brothers film that is a comedy where he turns into an angel and flies up in the sky while he's this incredibly grounded character who spits in a spittoon on a you know, steel death trap essentially in the middle of the ocean and you feel nothing but convinced by him. It's mm-hmm. those smaller side characters, I think, that that really sell me. Um, you, you know, we were talking about stars. Knight of Cups has Christian Bale, arguably one of the biggest stars. And in a tiny little aside, it has Dan Harmon, writer of Community, writer mm-hmm. of Rick and Morty, right? And, and it's... I think at some level he just he's an artist that's kind of above the studio system in a way Mm -hmm. you know I think about a hidden life and it's not as good as this or the new world but it 
it's close and it's totally distinctive and doesn't lean on any star power really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. To think about that movie coming out and being put out by the same studio as the one that put out Jojo rabbit and a hidden life once again, like, um, the thin red line, not getting much of a, response from general audiences jojo rabbit kind of exploding um i I think if history's indication we probably know which one might win out in the long run but time will tell well jojo rabbit actually has an interesting historical canon which i've recently come on to Mm. so don't don't you throw taika waititi under the bus now he's about to star in a terrence malick film i'm sure (laughs) that would that would force me to reconsider perhaps um well, let's talk about the nature of this. Mm. They start out on a steel boat, essentially, after Jim Caviezel is picked up from the island. And John Travolta tells Nick Nolte what the men need to do. And they are deployed onto an island and commanded to take a hill. That's it. Take the hill. And what you watch is in essence, just terror, the terror of war, passively told without really any judgment on one side or the other, which is interesting because normally um, in World War II films especially, it's very clear that there's the enemy and there's the hero. And this is more about war being not the enemy, but being unfortunate, perhaps. Mm and circumstantially negative and nature being the optimal and the way that he captures that with the lens um these moments of terror as they walk through the forest and then showing the forest by itself without men being so serene and peaceful there there's Mm. once again that interesting juxtaposition of art that that terrence is communicating yeah um I had wondered a little bit like why he wanted to start with Conviesel having gone AWOL rather than just sort of building up, you know, momentum towards this big battle scene where they're trying to take this hill. But I think I like first giving us a glimpse of what it looks like to kind of live in harmony with nature and sort of the Eden like feel of that of that life that the that the melanesian people live and that caviezel gets to ex- experience briefly um just because of the stark contrast that then offers when you see this you know just horror playing out on on this field um yeah i think that just again sets up some nice juxtaposition we'll see how many times we can use that word right in one episode that's i at, coming into this conversation I, I was like man how am i gonna not use juxtaposition and then i was just like i'm i'm going to lean into it yeah um th- there are some unknown actors I, I can particularly think of the um the character who goes to get the sidearm so that he can fight anybody who has a sword charging him. He's mm. he's uh he makes it all the way to the end of the film, as far as I recall. Mm-hmm. But there's there's these interesting character defining moments that Malik has a really keen eye for. And he puts them in so that we have an idea of who this is. And then whenever we encounter them, we just kind of think of that's who they are. The one person that I don't think this worked with was that running character who i think was a leader whose um wife wanted to divorce him Mm. i how did that work out for you that that was the one thing that i felt was a little um it it just didn't quite fit the film really that's actually one of my favorite threads of the movie because for me it's one of the more human where there's so much sort of contemplation and introspection you know through the the voiceover that's one of the more like really human aspects of the movie is just longing for the person you love and i kept watching those scenes and thinking that you know in 2020 someone would surely complain about the lack of dialogue given to the one female actress in the movie Mm. but i think that you know memory is much more about image than sound and words so i think that really plays quite beautifully for me um in 
giving the film one of its more, you know, human kinds of melancholy that's a little less spiritual in nature. But I could see why that makes it not fit so much, perhaps. Yeah, I think at the beginning I I was there for it. And then they just kind of kept the way that he structured the edits. He kind of hit it a, a couple times, I think, in like the hour leading up to the divorce letter. So it starts off slow. Maybe in the first hour, there's two. And then in that second hour, there's like three pretty abrupt cut twos about her that just really felt like a, a proportional setup rather than um, just passive storytelling. And and that's, you know, when you're talking about films that are kind of outside of the ranking structure, right? This isn't a, we, we will certainly grade this, I'm sure. But there are certain films that are, for me, outside of like, one through a hundred or zero through five. The new world is one of them. Um, there, there's a handful of others. I think that last and first men is probably something like that for me. There, there's very few where I just don't feel right about ranking them. And this is one of those where what you're getting is so deep. The story being told is so human, but also isn't just dependent on being film. It's it's something bigger than that. It's something that should be shown, as you said earlier, off the mic in history mm. classes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so you watch those scenes of the wife and think, save it for Tree of Life, Malik. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the first two, no problem. But you could tell there was a structural beat for mm. the plot. In the way that he was hitting it in the second hour for me. Because this is a yeah. three-hour film almost. I think it's 250. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were briefly talking about the taking of the hill itself. Just kind of mm-hmm. like the big kind of plot point of the movie. Um, just in a movie that is not very plot-driven. But um, I thought a lot about Paths of Glory, the Kubrick film. Mm-hmm. Um throughout that kind of stretch of the film. And I don't think of Malik as a clever director, one who's really interested in, in trying to be clever. But um, I did kind of like this idea that, you know, Nolte is out for personal glory in a way. He wants these accolades. He feels like he's put in the time. Now is his time. He's not going to give up now. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, you know, willing to, you know, let as many die let as many men die as it takes um which is just like the 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 story out of paths of glory which is in world war one but a a french um military man tells his subordinate to go on a suicide mission for the accolade he wants to do it for the accolade and i think there's where the cleverness comes in i think is just in this use of glory which comes up so much in the voiceover and sort of the trivial human glory that we pursue versus sort of the glory of transcendence of tapping into whatever this Mm -hmm. sort of universal fabric is that sort of unites everything um i think there's something kind of interesting about just the the idea of glory i guess i agree and i unfortunately don't have anything better to say than what you just said about glory so I, I will turn in a completely different direction and ask you uh, a, a question. When the men begin to take the hill, there's a light fog, a fog of war, mm. and there's indistinguishable figures mm. who the men begin to shoot. Mm. When that occurs, do you feel confident that they're shooting the right people? That had not even crossed my mind. Now I don't. Okay. Because I constantly in this film was wondering if that's friendly fire. Mm. Um, And I don't know if that's just because of my past war film reading history. Just knowing that so many men die specifically because of friendly fire. Mm. But just I I think that the first guys that he kills are, are men with stretchers with a stretcher mm. between them. Mm-hmm. And I remember distinctly thinking like, oh, is that Caviezel? Is he dead now? Mm. That actually did cross my mind when you see them walking up the hill in the stretcher from a distance. They do not look like they are Japanese. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hadn't, 
that hadn't crossed my mind during the scene where they're marching through the fog, but that is disturbing in hindsight to consider that as a possibility, in which case it is very subtle, which is even more kind of affecting, perhaps. Yeah, that, that's something that, for me, continued to occur as they were taking out the uh, the hatches underground and stuff, as they, mm-hmm. they took stuff, like, I was like, how do you know that one of your guys didn't go up that ladder and that you're shooting him as he walks up, like, it, it's, um it's a very tense film in the war scenes. And I think that that's translated to the viewer in such an effective passive way Mm. that um, like, okay. So saving private Ryan, I think, do you agree is a, is a good film, if not a great one? Well, to be fair, I haven't seen it in a long time. I shouldn't, I should almost like stop talking about it. Uh, But yeah, I think it's a good film for sure. Okay. I think that the best war film we've had since then is Dunkirk, which is entirely different and more about the heroism of large groups of men and individuals and how individuals in large groups can can kind of, you know, turn the tides and stuff. Mm. But between Dunkirk and this film or Saving Private Ryan, kind of up to you, has there been a truly great war film of, the, of this nature? And you can't say Tropic Thunder, because we already agree that's the best film. Come on. Yeah, it ain't 1917, that's for sure. Not one that comes to mind. I'm sure there's something that should be considered. It's not really the genre that I'm intimately familiar with, but yeah, nothing comes to mind. Did nothing else for you? No, I mean, well, I mean, war is a general thing, right? Like, you you could throw in a, a lot of different films, People could argue that Star Wars or Marvel films or war films. I, I don't think so. For for me, the closest would be some of those sword and sandal films. Whether you want to go Kingdom of Heaven, Troy, Gladiator, those are the closest things for me. And the really, only, I haven't seen them in a long time. And the only one that really gets that close for me would be um, Scott's Kingdom of Heaven extended cut, which is like three hours and 15 minutes. And that's just because of the the story that Orlando Bloom goes on. Um, so I, I think that this is kind of one of those last great war films of this nature, which in retrospect is very interesting to see that there hasn't been kind of a renaissance of of war films as you know, Marvel has begun to become the blockbuster, we seem less and less interested in the real toil and cost of war. Yeah, totally. I could almost see, like, a James Gray doing oh, this kind of... Oh, don't you tempt me. Don't you tempt me with that. You know, he because he does big-budget stuff, whether it's, like, Velocity of Z or, or Ad Astra, but these aren't, like, entirely commercially friendly. Those have stars, too. But there's, there's kind of some idiosyncrasy there that I think general audiences don't really connect with. Um, and I think it's harder and harder to get those made. But he's someone I could see, you know, making a film of this scale and having some kind of personal take on it. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Now I'm just thinking about the films I want made, not that have been made. So, yeah. I If we're going there, I, I will say I'd like to see an Alfonso Cuaron mm. Um just like brutal horror war film <laughs> in the vein fair, of prisoner fair. of azkaban you know like mm. get go dark for me there you go there you go <laughs> um so yeah i mean funny anecdote i guess um back to the film itself when you left it how did you feel I felt great. I, I I felt great. I I loved the movie. So it, it's all good feeling, but mm. it is one that is, you know, very, very stirring. You know, it, I think it speaks much more to the soul than the mind. It's one that kind of resists analysis in a way because it is so um, kind of deliberately open ended. I could see some people maybe calling considering that kind of a cop out, like maybe there's not enough uh, definitiveness to it, but to me, that just makes it linger in my mind. Um, what about you? Yeah, so specifically that it's not up for closer analysis, really. I, I feel that very distinctly. I, I was asked hours after I'd finished watching it what I thought from a friend. And, you know, we're about to end our conversation here in the next 
minutes and i i still don't know how to comfortably say what i think about this film and feel like i said what i think about it Hmm. um and that's very very few and far between films can can do that to someone can feel nearly perfect and also indistinguishable or or on utterable in some way there's something so distinctly profound and human and against the nature of further discussion this is something that it should be a personal experience which i think behooves that thing that you talked about in the beginning which is the nature of malik's spirituality bleeding into films spirituality i think at its best is personal yeah absolutely um one thing I thought about when I was watching one of the bonus features on the Blu-ray disc was how when some of the crew members, whether they're actors or editors, are talking about Malik's style, and this is true, I think, of him just in general, not just the Thin Red Line, sometimes they can't help but move their hands as they're describing what the movie is like, um, and that's when... You know, I wish we were a visual medium and not a podcast because you can tell them you can tell they're trying to express the fluidity of it. You can't help but want to like move your hands just to capture or ex- express the motion that characterizes his films. Um, I think that is a little tricky, you know, to uh, get across in words is just sort of the movement that is so much a part of what the, those movies are. The camera's never still or very rarely still um so i just thought that was funny watching people try to get it across and they're kind of you know getting their hands moving in the air trying to get it across yes i agree there's something about malik films that are like an ocean or a running body of water in which they're constantly moving and they're fluid so you can point at them and say that they're there but when you ask what is the substance how wide how long how heavy it it gets very tricky and and you you focus more on individual ripples in that river or ocean um or or different turns and and, you know swells rather than the whole body of the thing because it like being adrift on on one you can really only account for those different moments where you're doing it, you can't account for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that metaphor. It's more focused on the ripples than the big splash or something like that. Like that. Um, This this is pivoting just slightly to music in the film. The score is by Hans Zimmer and it's during those battle sequences that you hear that uh, ticking of like a clock a little bit. And there's just that, ticking that starts to play that feels like right out of a nolan movie in a way that feels directly influential on dunkirk for sure for sure i know that was a a bit of a pivot but i just didn't want to forget that because that instantly came to mind as soon as i heard that in a movie that's otherwise not so much about trying to like build momentum you can tell hans zimmer really wants to there there um within the score there's also rather than just being beautiful there, there's moments where the orchestra sounds great and then becomes kind of screeching or grating, which I don't think I've ever heard in a war film before. The, these great compositions and, and, I mean, Hans Zimmer, one of the greatest composers of all time, inarguable. And the piece that he has has this great swell of a musical score and then all of a sudden there's a screech mm. at the end of it, kind of you know, ruining this beautiful thing, which you can't help but superimpose onto the visuals, which is this beautiful nature being lit on fire and bombed to hell. Yeah, which is why it's appropriate to listen to it loud, as the Blu-ray tells you to do. Yes, uh, as the director requests. (laughs) I have never seen that before on a Blu-ray disc. It's like the first thing you see on on the Criterion disc when you hit play, right? I, I believe so. I've it's on some other stuff. I believe it's on the New World as well. Mm. I think that Terry always requests that all of his films be played very loud, though. Fair enough. Yeah, it doesn't seem like he would say the opposite. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to get to before we go to favorite scenes? Um, I don't know. Maybe just something, just 
some comments about the the theme of unity that so much of the voiceover seems to be getting at. Um, I think there's something kind of bold about that. Um, you know, I, I could see, um, I, as you can tell, I'm still gathering my thoughts. I don't know. I wish I had more of the voiceover like lines in front of me. I, I didn't write as many of them down as I should, but there are those comments about strife and love perhaps being features of the same face. Um, that just seems like maybe the thing that's kind of, um, extending across different Malick films, especially the the new world is just this idea that everything is part of one thing. Um, I don't have that much more to say about it than that, but that just seems like the central idea of, um, what, what this film is getting at, that the, that the beauty and the ugliness is all, um, of one central source um yeah i don't know i'm just talking out loud i i know exactly where you're at that's how i still feel there is something equivalent equivalent between the new world and the thin red line that is to do with men's darker nature and men's better nature and the nature of the world without men and I don't know that I could ever really explore that on the fly through conversation. That's more of a spend a year writing a a paper type of a task. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess I say the word bold just because like, I feel like so many people who respond to Malik films are not necessarily super religious or spiritual people. And yet, there's something just kind of irresistible about this notion of oneness or togetherness that I do find very comforting. Um, even though I consider myself a very logically and scientifically minded person. And yeah, um, I don't know. Something about that seems bold in a world that so prizes um, individuality and individual humanity and that kind of thing. Yeah, he's kind of taken up the best parts of transcendentalism. Mm-hmm. That, that came to America from England when we founded our country. And he's really put them through the personal, you, you know, ideal of, of what seems mappable to him for the future. And his films get rid of a lot of the bad ideas that transcendentalists have and focuses really on the, the beauty and nature and the kindness of men and the strength of, of men and n- not the strength of men arbitrarily hurting other men, but rather the the kindness you know there there's nothing like watching Jim Caviezel tell Sean Penn to or not Sean Penn um Adrian Brody to run mm. while he sacrifices his own life so mm. that Adrian Brody doesn't have to there th- that is that transcendental thing that that you know came from that early Christianity that he's tapping into that is more about the naturalism and, and the wonder and the beauty and the kindness rather than any overarching um, quoting of a testament. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So what's your favorite scene? It's really hard not to go with the very first shot of the movie, which we haven't talked about, which is of this alligator slithering into the water which i just feel like so encapsulates some of the central ideas of the movie about this this ominous image containing so much beauty at the same time it's like an incredibly beautiful and powerful shot but it's also there's fear in it it's 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 there's so much danger lurking beneath the surface that just seems like the the point of the movie in a way it's really hard not to go with that i'll 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 stop there for now maybe just pick that what about you well, I think you said alligator, and I think you meant crocodile, because I think that oh, it could crocodiles be crocodiles are what they are outside in the South of Pacific. the Pacific. Yeah. Well, I think that outside of North America, South America, there's no alligators. I might this be wrong there. Uh, um, this isn't happening in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> correct. Um, well, I actually don't know where it's shot, so I won't say that. But um, so I'm going to go with when the crocodile is in the pickup. No, I'm kidding. Nice. Um, I I will say the. The scene that that I just talked about in which I I don't really know where the parameters are for that, but the the three men in the river behind a stump growing 
up through a rushing river as hordes of soldiers run down the riverbed. And he passively tells him that he's going to sacrifice his life and that he should run. And then he um, helps the other wounded man get out of the riverbank and tells him to roll into the river once he, he hears the sounds. And then he begins running. There's just something so selfless, but also um, of the self, self-sacrificial mm. um, and taking ownership of that. That is um, not just beautiful, but in the trajectory of the film is beautiful in growth. Yeah. And that hits on like the, the question that I still haven't figured out in a way. I know we're trying to wrap up, not keep going, but indulge me just for a second because i just so expected knowing literally nothing about the story of this movie i so expected caviezel's character if anything to be more like a conscientious objector or something like that i thought he might kind of hacksaw ridge yeah cry foul at some point after having seen you know such a peaceful kind of existence he would be horrified but he jumps back into action fairly quick and then is you know ready to sacrifice himself like i think just the the, the the journey he's gone through mentally, I think it's kind of hard to, it's kind of elusive for me. Um, it's personal. What's, yeah. What's led him to that point where he feels like he's ready to do that. I think is something hard personal. To figure out. Yeah. And, and we see the area that it occurred. It's that, mm. it's that beginning, but we don't know what that was for him. And I think that is, what makes it beautiful because so many people have their own things like that and we don't know what they are. And even if they told us we wouldn't feel it, we'd just hear them telling us and maybe we'd understand a quarter of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's something about that that is embedded within the film, that nature of knowing that we can't understand, but still searching and understanding things that we don't actually comprehend um, that is so beautiful and is tied to so many Malick films. I like it. Let's end there. And that's another one in the can. Now you don't.